LBC. From Global's newsroom at 8 o'clock, the US says it can't validate Russia's claim that Ukraine tried to assassinate President Putin using drones in Moscow. Authorities say the military and security forces disabled two drones before they could strike the Kremlin. Kim Sebgupta is defence editor at The Independent. He's told LBC there's yet to be any credible evidence. There has been some footage of smoke arising from uh, some part of the Kremlin. This obviously not proof that any such attempt took place. Officials in Ukraine deny that Kiev was involved. A 13-year-old's parents have been arrested over a school shooting in Serbia. Authorities say the teenager may be too young to be held criminally responsible for the attack in which nine people died. A series of strikes by security guards at Heathrow Airport will go ahead tomorrow after last-minute talks broke down. Around 1,400 members of Unite, based at Terminal 5, will walk out three times this month. And police in London say they're not aware of any specific threat for the King's coronation, but that security is being stepped up. Around 30,000 officers from the Met and across the country have been deployed in the lead-up to Saturday. In the city, the FTSE 100 has closed up 15 points at 77.88. The pound buys a dollar 25 and a euro 13. LBC weather: rain becoming confined to the far north of Scotland. Elsewhere will be clear, with rain arriving in the far southwest by the morning. An overnight low of three. From Global's newsroom for LBC, I'm Charlotte Morgan. This is LBC from Global. Leading Britain's conversation, Cross Question, with Ian Dale. Hello and a warm welcome to the programme. It's Wednesday's Cross Question on LBC with me, Ian Dale. On the panel tonight, sitting to my left is Jamie Driscoll, Labour Mayor of the North of Tyne region. Sitting next to him, Sir Peter Bottomley, the Conservative MP for Worthing West, who's father of the House of Commons. Oliver Cam, on my right, is a journalist and contributor to the Times. And sitting between him and me is Inaya following Iman. She is the founder and director of the Equiano Project, a think tank focused on freedom of speech. Uh, lots to, talk, to call in about tonight. I uh, want to give, give you a little bit of guidance on the subjects that you might want to talk about. Uh, the party leaders have made their final pitches for tomorrow's local elections. Anti-monarchy campaigns have hit out at warning letters about the effect which the new Public Order Act could have on their protests at the coronation. Uh, the U- Ukraine has denied Russian claims that it attempted to assassinate President Putin using a drone strike. And former Chancellor George Osborne says smoking should be completely banned. That's an interesting one, isn't it? 0345 6060 973 is the number to call. You can text 84850 and you can say, Alexa, send a comment to LBC as well as watch us on Global Player. Call 0345 6060 973. Tweet at LBC. Text 84850. Cross question with Ian Dale. This is LBC. I think George Osborne also said that he thinks the sugar tax should be expended to fruit juices. Someone please ask a question on both of those, because I'm dying to hear what our panel might think about that. Um, Right, uh, let's go to Kevin in Basingstoke as our first caller. Hello, Kevin. Hello. How will voter ID affect tomorrow's elections? How will voter ID affect tomorrow's election? Now, Jamie Driscoll, you are here because there isn't an election in your region, but um, on the general subject of voter ID, um, what do you think? Um, well, I'm not up for election, but there are a lot of council elections uh, knocking on the doors. It, has, it is worrying some people. I, I spoke to someone just at the weekend who was saying that they don't have a driving licence, they don't have a passport, live with their elderly mother who can use a bus pass, um, but he can't vote. Um, and that is affecting people. And, and given the, the scale of the problem, what was it last year? I looked this up. There were three in the entire country, West Yorkshire, Hampshire and Kent, um, cases of actual people trying to, to vote illegally. One was acquitted, one was convicted, one was given a police caution. I mean, it's way beyond uh, the response necessary for a problem that doesn't exist. Um, and the, the direct answer to the question is long term, it will just put more people off voting 
and I think that's ultimately a bad thing. But there are lots person. of ways that people can identify themselves. I think the government have issued a list and that they, people could also apply for free photo ID from their local authority. I mean, the deadline for that is gone now, but they, they right. could have done that. Um, were you pointing that out to people? Um, yeah, and again, the, the deadline has gone, but that's the issue. I mean, we certainly, I believe, we want maximum kind of turnouts and political engagement. In local elections, it's hard to get above 30%. If you're then saying to people, you must go and fill in this extra paperwork before a certain deadline and then go down and vote, then it's, why, why are we putting barriers up to people voting? But most other countries have... You have to show some ID to vote. What, what you do in Northern Ireland, it ha doesn't seem to have affected turnout there. Well, why is it such a problem? Uh, well, partly it's a, it's a problem because it's a problem to a, a solution to a problem that doesn't exist. I think it's unnecessary. I think we have to keep making that point. When there were only three cases last year. Well, three cases that, that came to court, but I mean, I don't know whether Peter would corroborate this, but when I was in, involved in politics, every polling day, you would get call after call into the local party office from people saying, I can't vote because somebody's already voted in my name. Now, it's quite difficult then to find out who's done that, so very few cases get to court, but it does happen. Um, I looked at the, the, the cases, and there's actually there's a tiny number, um, and there's as many on postal votes, by the way, um, So, and there's, there's no voter ID on that. Um, but well, you, the, have, you have to give your signature and date of birth. Yeah, but again, if, if people... I mean, how many people do you have to organise? to influence even a council seat. I mean, I just no, don't talk, talk to someone in Tower Hamlets. That's um, probably a good start. I, well, <laughs> or, or I, certainly in the North East, I've never even heard of it being an issue that people are complaining about. Um, but if we are talking about ID cards, we have a very different tradition in this country. I quite like our libertarian tradition that you are not stopped and asked for your papers on the street. Um, and that's something I think that's worth preserving. Jackie Smith were here, she'd argue on that one on ID cards, wouldn't <laughs> she? But, uh, uh, Peter Bottomley, is this a sledgehammer to crack a nut? Well, first of all, the Electoral Commission recommended it in 2014, and recommended it again more strongly in 2015, so we're only eight years on from that. Secondly, it was, if, we're going, if we want to play party politics, I hope we aren't going too much, it was the Labour government who brought in voter ID in Northern Ireland. Voter ID has been required in the Republic of Ireland for a long time, and I've heard it said by my friends, that if you go to a Labour Party meeting to help choose a candidate, you have to show photo ID to show that you're a member to qualified to vote. So if it's good enough for the Labour Party, it's good enough for my electors. <laughs> what about the point, though, that, as Jamie says, there's only been three cases in the last year well, I, that I, have gone I, to court? I, I don't think I can do better than you did in saying uh, if someone has personated somebody else and voted, somebody else comes along and says, I want to vote, I'm the person. The electoral registration, people, the polling station clerks can't prove who it was who nicked the vote from somebody else. So I think you need to count all the ways in which fraud is possible. Uh, James right, rightly said that uh, postal votes are a problem, and so is multiple registration in houses which may have three beds, which sometimes have 18 voters registered there. They aren't all in the forces and, and overseas. Uh, I, I think that the fuss is uh, some people going through the motions. The biggest issue, which again he, he raised, and I'll support him on this, is the 70% of people who don't vote. When, when he and I are standing for election, our people are as alternatives. We're alternatives, we're not the enemies. The enemies are the apathy and the ignorance, the people who don't, don't care or don't know and won't vote. And it's very important that we recognise why dictators don't let people vote in other countries. We're not a dictatorship. We should vote. But this is not going to encourage people to vote, is it? I mean, there is there is going to there are going to be people who, for whatever reason, and I suspect it is generally that they can't be bothered. To, to get the paperwork that they need if they haven't got a passport or driving licence. The, the, the maximum number who could be put off would be 1% to 2%. And we're already talking about the 60% in some places, 70% in others, where people don't vote. But so Labour, the, the, Labour's contention is that these people will be more likely to be their voters than yours. Well, they, they, they can say that they like, and that was the argument against extending uh, the vote to more than 2.5% of the population in 1831, 1832, in 1867. And you were in the House of Commons then. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, people said you shouldn't let women vote because they'll... they'll, they'll they, and basically, people don't want to extend the vote to under 21s or people at age 16 because they think they'll vote the other way. And I think that's the wrong decision. You mm. should give them the vote and then the political parties or political really candidates well. can then compete to get the votes of those who've got them. Oliver Cam, is this a burning issue for you? I largely agree with Jamie. I think it is a phantom problem. And crucially, the penalties for impersonation, uh, for 
electoral fakery are very harsh indeed, and with good reason. The marginal difference that a fraudulent vote will make to an ele electoral outcome is almost zero, and the deterrent effect of uh, a, a stiff penalty, a custodial sentence, um, uh, is, is very high, and that's as it ought to be. The problem with this proposal, I've not got, unlike Jamie, I've not got anything particularly against um, identity cards in the digital age. I think there's a, there's a, there's a, a good use for them. But the problem I have with this particular um, uh, scheme, this particular policy, is that at the margin it will deter people from voting when, as the politicians have said, we should be encouraging uh, participation. And there is the perception, to put it no higher, that the, 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 the requiring voter ID will be um, more beneficial for the Conservatives because their demographic is older voters compared with parties of the left and the centre, and older people tend to have passports uh, and driving licences to a greater degree than younger people. And the disparity between um, a voter ID, a, a and I think a senior Oyster card is accepted um, as a voter ID, but a young person's rail card is not. And but at you the use the word perception, though. You can't make a law based on perception. It has to be on reality. And in Northern Ireland, Sinn Féin won the last election there, a party of the left, where they have voter ID. Well, um, that... There are, there are communal issues in Northern Ireland that don't apply to the rest of the United Kingdom. Um, and when you get, um, uh, I think, a, a, a justified perception that, that, a, that an electoral scheme has been adopted with a differential outcome for different parties, then that's a real problem. It's not like the United States, where, as we know, uh, a, a sitting president attempted outright sedition and uh, not just gerrymandering but outright mm. sedition but it is a problem it's a it's a uh, it's a the, the issue of um, of voter fraud is just not that salient in british politics and i i i, I don't think the, uh, the the measure is necessary and the outcome will be detrimental you know i do think it is a, a solution looking for a problem but i'm not I, to me, that's probably the kind of strongest argument that it's not necessarily a major issue in the country. Voter fraud isn't um, a, a big problem. But I'm, I'm not necessarily convinced by the arguments that um, it's going to marginalise you know, certain voters. I've, I've heard a lot of discussion about ethnic minority voters and, and young people. But generally speaking, the overwhelming majority of people have some form of ID. And if people don't have some form of ID, um, then I think it is wise to encourage people to get them because there's all sorts of situations in everyday life that you're going to need it, whether that's, you know, driving. Well, they clearly don't think so because that's what they haven't got it. They haven't needed it. Well, I think it, I think I don't think it's a big ask for people to acquire some form of ID within society. But the question of whether or not it's a issue for um, the the extent to which people are, there there is voter fraud in the country, I just don't see that as a reality. Let's take this quick text question from Chris in Stubbington, who says, "Should term limits be imposed upon council leaders?" I don't know what drives that question. Um, as the only... Well, you're not a council leader, are you? are slightly elevated from a council <laughs> leader, Jamie, but um, would you welcome term limits in, in any form of politics? Um, again, I think... I have a general principle that if you have to put a rule in place, um, that's usually a last solution. You've got to think, look, if there's a problem that council leaders are serving a long time and somehow that's a bad thing, we should be looking at the causes of that. Now, I think, I mean, I, I don't know how many terms Peter served, but it's a lot. Um, then if his electors are happy with him, what's the issue? Um, and mm. I don't think arbitrary term limits are necessarily a good thing. Um, but, but there particularly are... the idea of lame duck... There are many examples throughout the country of councils who've been effectively one-party states for decades, both Conservative and Labour. I'm not sure about Liberal, Liberal Democrats. Um, where I live in Tunbridge Wells, it, it was a one-party state for decades. They became lazy, uh, I, I would say partially corrupt as well. Um, but Tunbridge Wells being Tunbridge Wells, they, they kept getting re-elected. Now, they, they have... Um, in the last elections, the Liberal Democrats took over with some with some independents. So it it has changed, and the voters spoke, but it took a, a well, long time. That's not the issue of, of the term leader, uh, of the terms no. of leader or a council, a specific councillor. So I think it comes down to the fact that if you have, and and there are many, what are referred to as rotten boroughs, where 
um, you know, you stick the colour of the rose out and people get in. Um, I think that's a bigger issue for democracy. Um, and why do we not have, for example, more proportional representation is one of the ways you want to address that. OK, Ilo. Yeah, no, I think I, I, I would agree with that. I mean, I do think that there are some councils up and down the country that seem to operate like fiefdoms and cartels. And it's very difficult for uh, many of the ordinary people within that particular community to actually do something about it. So I think that that is a democratic question. And particularly there. when you have a third of the council being elected to one year, then a third the next. You can't get rid of the buggers. No, exactly. So I don't necessarily know if um, imposing limits is the solution. But I do think that we have to look at whether or not um, the councils are being as democratic and accountable that they could be to the people voting for them. Oliver? There is a problem of fiefdoms of safe seats at both parliamentary and municipal level, and you do get idle, incompetent, and sometimes outright corrupt um, representatives as a result. I don't think that term limit, certainly at the municipal level, is the answer. Again, it seems to me um, uh, a... Um, an organisational expedient to deal with a real problem, but quite a superficial one. Um, politics. I, I actually do think that um, uh, PR in some form um, would be a, a, a wake-up call to politics, um, but term limits, I don't think that's a viable, a viable proposal. Peter Bottomley. Well, I have to declare an interest that I lost my first three elections and I haven't lost one since. Um, and we... Because uh, you've been in the House of Commons since, is it 1976? 75. 75. That, with, that, with a little break. No, no break. Oh, did you not? I thought, you, I thought that no, was... I, I, they, the boundary commissioners uh, went and destroyed the seat I ha had. Oh, I see. Yeah. Uh, my, my, my first 22 years, I represented a constituency who had the strongest lab, constituency Labour Party in the country. They had 4,500 members, which made people sort of think that those are the days. Uh, and since then, I've been... I moved from Woolwich West to Worthing West. If the question is about council leaders... First of all, you ought to encourage people to be party members. You can be an independent member of a, of a council. A lot of people did, even if they were Conservative or Labour. But, you know, you don't have, but most people have a party label to them nowadays. They didn't 50, 70 years ago. If you can have a number of people in your ward who will challenge you if you're not being a very good representative, if you can have people in your constituency Labour Party or Conservative Association or whether the Liberal Democrats and the other good parties have, you don't have a right to be there. And in a council group, it's the councillors in your group who decide who's their leader, and that comes up every year in any decent uh, organisation. And if you can maintain um, them supporting you, fine, but young Turks can come along and, and uh, have a little revolution. And you fought them all off? I, well, I haven't been a council leader. I, 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 I occasionally have my whips telling me what to do, and I occasionally <laughs> tell them what to do, and we're very happy. <laughs> um, sorry, quickly. Part of the issue is that local government has been so underfunded, so stripped of power, that it's actually pretty unappealing to be a councillor. And I think if we restored the power of local government, you'd actually get a great deal more competition for places, so to speak. OK, we'll take more of your questions in a moment. If you'd like to put a question to our panel, the number to call 0345 6060 973. It's 18 minutes past eight. LBC.
Business. Leading Britain's conversation. Cross question with Ian Dale. Tweet at LBC. 21 minutes past eight on LBC. Jamie Driscoll, Labour Mayor of the North of Tyne. I wouldn't say authority. Is it North of Tyne region? Combined authority. Combined authority. Let's get it right. Uh, we have Sir Peter Bottomley, who's Conservative MP for Worthing West and father of the House of Commons. Oliver Cam is a journalist and contributor to The Times. And Inaya Follerin Iman, who is founder and director of the Equiano Project, a think tank focused on freedom of speech. Now, let's have a brief word about that. Um, why did you want to start this project? I actually founded it in 2020 in response to the Black Lives Matter movement and it was essentially a, a forum to platform a broader range of ethnic minority views because oftentimes we hear one view which is that ethnic minority people think that Britain's institutionally racist and that racism is embedded within British society and all disparities in outcomes are a result of racism but actually lots of the ethnic minority people that I knew are also in public life um, have a different view and so it's to promote a wider public debate that many ethnic minority people support freedom of speech are very patriotic and actually think that Britain is quite progressive when it comes to uh, being a, an equal, tolerant society. Do you get a lot of blowback from people from different ethnic minorities on this? Well, I actually think that a lot of the, the narrative that is talked about in the public conversation is actually at odds with a lot of what ethnic minority people think. I mean, one of the things we often talk about is attitudes towards the police. But polling consistently shows that the overwhelming majority of um, black Britons, for example, um, think that the police is a, a force for good overwhelmingly. And so oftentimes when you actually speak to ordinary black Britons and Asian Britons and, and so on, they have much more nuanced views on what's presented. And we should explain for people who are listening rather than watching, you are black yourself, because I, mean, I imagine yeah. there might be some people thinking, well, how dare a white person say this sort of thing? And uh, I bet you, I'm sure yeah. you get that a lot. Peter? I know the answer to the question of where Equiano was baptised. Well, I wasn't the, asking that the, question, the, but if you wish to answer the it... The answer is 50 yards from here at St Margaret's Church, Westminster. Is that right? Did you know that? No, I didn't, but just a bit of background about Equiano. He's an 18th century a former slave and abolitionist, and he's of British um, African heritage, and what's amazing about his story is that he bought his own freedom. So I, he's a good example of extraordinary bravery and courage, even in times of uh, uh, suffering. We have a lot of historical context on the show because, uh, Peter Bottomley, your grandfather's office was exactly where we're sitting now, wasn't it? That's Back right. in the, was he, it the 1930s? He, he, his last job in the civil service was as senior agent for the colonies, so he, he bought their postage stamps and their currency. Um, and Someone had to. Well, that's true. <laughs> uh, if I'd worked hard at university, I'd have joined the civil service like my, my brother, my niece, my father and our grandfather, but I didn't, so I came into a... a Merchant venturing a bit like Equiano did. He, he was a, a mm. businessman. Indeed. And then uh, when I was putting neon lights outside theatres and cinemas of the West End, I was congratulated by a Prime Minister for my bravery in clearing up an IRA bomb. And I thought, this Prime Minister doesn't do any heavy lifting, doesn't need a raincoat. I get terrified swinging in the cradle at heights. I get dizzy if I stand on my dignity. How'd you come an MP? Someone told me and I became one. Oh. <laughs> right. Well, let's go to another question. It is from David in Enfield. Hello, David. Good evening, panel. Hope you're well. We all are. What would you like to say, David? Uh, what is the point of PMQs if the Prime Minister deliberately avoids answering opposition questions with the Speaker failing to intervene? Could you not have asked that question at any point in the last five decades? Or do you think it's worse now? Uh, well, I think it's worse, much worse than the last uh, six months, particularly today. I have to say, I didn't see today, but um, it, 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 is a, it is a notable thing in PMQs, and it's not just Rishi Sunak. You can go back to most prime ministers. I think Theresa May made quite an effort to answer questions, but she wasn't be beyond this as well. Inaya, let's start with you. Well, you know, I think the great thing about PMQs is filmed and that if politicians or the Prime Minister and the opposition are answering questions, then the public can make up their own mind about whether or not uh, the uh, leader of the country is paying attention to and, and addressing the issues that people have directly. But, you know, I think it is important, the point that was made in terms of the deterioration over the last six months. I do think in the country there is a sense that the challenges that Britain are facing, the cost of living, energy crisis, um, crisis, you know, in geopolitics, that... The, the challenges are just not being faced um, with authority and strength and that they're kind of being avoided. So I think that oftentimes PMQs can reflect that sense of 
well, the, the issues are huge, but there isn't that seriousness in actually addressing them. Oliver? PMQs is an absolutely vital part of Britain's unwritten constitution. It allows the public and uh, members of parliament <coughs> to see how the respective party leaders perform under pressure. Some party leaders are absolutely hopeless. Uh, famously, Edward Heath was hopeless against Harold Wilson for whatever it was, um, uh, 10 years. Um, uh, William Hague, who was electorally highly unsuccessful, was very good at Prime Minister's questions, much good that it did him. Um, uh, but the most important um, feature of this, um, it isn't just pantomime, this, uh, this um, uh, regular series of interrogations is that the Prime Minister doesn't know what question is going to come up and has to think on his or her feet. And that's a good thing for the electorate to see. Um, it, it used to be uh, still more important when both main parties restricted the choice of party leader to members of parliament alone, which I think is the only rational thing to do, rather than give it to party activists who are in the main a lot more ideological. Um, I don't think, um, I, perhaps the questioner is alluding to the fact that since he became Prime Minister, Rishi Sunak typically responds to any question from um, Sir Keir Starmer by pointing to the, 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 the phantom of Jeremy Corbyn and um, uh, Sir Keir's um, support for Corbyn as Prime Minister. That's wearing a little thin. Sir Keir Starmer is plainly not Jeremy Corbyn and the Labour Party has, which I think has a great deal to atone for over those disastrous years in opposition, but Sir Keir Starmer has clearly changed the Labour Party a lot. But that redounds to the discredit or the disadvantage of uh, the Prime Minister rather than of the process of Prime Minister's questions itself. Jamie Driscoll. I think you've got to decide what the purpose of PM's cues is. And I actually agree with David. You watch this thing and you think, why is nobody answering the question? Um, I run uh, Mayor's Question Time on a regular basis across the North East. Members of the public can ask me a question. Um, but we ask, could they please, it's up to them, submit it in advance? Because if you do, I'll give you a better answer. And I think this idea that we should judge our... Um, politicians on the basis of how good are they at stand-up comedy, which is the way that, that Boris Johnson used to run it, I don't think is very good. And what you want is actually a genuine answer to the question. Um, and if someone's saying, look, this has been a perpetual problem for years, why haven't you fixed it? How are you going to fix it? I think we've got to decide, do we want spectacle or do we want scrutiny? And if it's scrutiny, we do have to say, you must answer the question, but we'll give you a fair chance to answer the question by giving you some notice. Or, if it is, as Oliver's suggesting, you want to see how people respond under pressure, um, well, let's do it differently and let's just have them interviewed by journalists on television. More people would see it. Well, but there, there is a reason why Americans love to watch PMQs, because they don't get the chance for their politicians to come under that kind mm. of pressure. Similarly, if you, if you watch the German Bundestag, which has a question time session a bit like what you're suggesting, nobody watches it. It's incredibly boring. We, we learn a lot about our politicians, whether they're the ones asking the questions or whether they're the ones answering them, by... The, this process, which I admit sometimes isn't particularly edifying, but I never buy this argument, oh, people hate all the Yabu in the House of Commons. They don't, because they that's when they watch it, Prime Minister's questions, which is the most Yabu bit of it. Um, yeah, so it's there for spectacle. Is is you, Well, it's the become a spectacle. That. Yes, it has. You're right. Um, and I think we've got to decide. If it's about scrutiny, we have to do but it But it different. engages people in a way that uh, the a select committee does not. Um, I think that's probably true. Um, but uh, the, the select committees are often very dry, very specific and niche. Um, you could still have a Prime Minister's question where you're actually saying you haven't answered the question, which was, which was David's point, is mm. they should answer the questions and it would be better if they did rather than judging what insult okay. Rishi Sunak's going to throw this week at Sir Keir Starmer. Peter Bottomley. Well, and <coughs> David, of course, is right. It's not the way the world is. The hottest ticket in Westminster is Prime Minister's Questions. It's like being able to watch, some people want to watch a whole of a football game, other people want just to see the sending offs, the arguments with the referee, the goals, um, and, and the, the tears and, 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 and the cheers. Parliament can be great theatre. If you have 400 people squashed in there, it's going to be theatre. You're going to get your booing. If you have 14 people, they can have decent conversation. If you only have four people, they can have even, even better conversation, but the right people aren't always there. I think that. Everything that's said about it is true. It, it, it's not done right, but 
it won't last if it becomes dull and boring. And if you ask people when they watch their own Parliament or National Assembly or Congress in session, the answer is hardly ever. At least in our system, uh, the leader of the opposition and other members of Parliament, whether on the government side or not, can challenge. There's no major issue that comes up when Parliament's sitting that isn't raised during Prime Minister's questions. So people can't duck. And if I can just make one government point, all the time, every department is thinking what might be raised with the Prime Minister, where's our brief to the Prime Minister, and what are we doing about it? So in fact, it's a very important part of getting government to work better, civil service to work better, ministers to be concentrated. If they thought it was never going to be raised, they'd be uh, less assiduous. You, you served under 11 prime ministers, if I'm right. Which has been the best at PMQs and which has been the worst? How Wilson, uh, I said, why do you treat some people one way and some another? He said, I treat people the way they treat me. And if someone asks a decent question, I give them a decent answer. And if they do Yabu, I do Yabu too. Um, I, I was lucky enough to, my first two unsuccessful parliamentary elections, I was standing against a lovely man called Bill Hamling, who had been his PPS, as a 60-year-old former Marine sergeant. And Bill and I used to go to a pub every Saturday lunchtime and declare the election was off for the weekend. <laughs> <laughs> and we got on perfectly well. We, we, we were the alternatives to each other. In the same way, it's not a secret, that when the King was coming to Great Hall of Westminster a couple of days ago, I was standing with Sir Keir Starmer and with Rishi Sunak, the Prime Minister, having a perfectly decent conversation with Harriet Harman there as well, uh, on occasion with the Speaker, going on perfectly well. And uh, at the end of it, uh, the Prime Minister said to the opposition, well, see you tomorrow, and in a friendly way. And they have this sort of hammer and tongs. It's not fake. No, they, they really are trying to lead their own people forward, uh, especially with local elections going on. But they're both decent people. And I think that, uh, if I pick up one of Oliver's points, it is a good idea if we reverse William Hague's mistake when he was criticised for being chosen by MPs and not by the party members. He said, party members next time. I think it's better if it's done by MPs who can understand what party members okay. want, but we'll get it right. Right, we'll take more of your questions in a moment. It's 8.33. Let's get the latest news headlines on LBC with Charlotte Morgan. America says it can't validate Russia's claim that Ukraine tried to assassinate President Putin in Moscow. Authorities say security forces disabled two drones. Ukraine officials deny involvement. A 13-year-old's parents have been arrested over a school shooting in Serbia. Eight children and a security guard were killed in Belgrade. Authorities say the teenager may be too young to be held criminally responsible. And a series of strikes by security guards at Heathrow Airport will go ahead as planned tomorrow after last-minute talks broke down. Around 1,400 members of Unite based at Terminal 5 will walk out three times this month. LBC weather, rain becoming confined to the far north of Scotland. Clear elsewhere with a low of three. This is LBC.
Cross Question with Ian Dale on LBC. If you've just tuned in, let me reintroduce my panel. Jamie Driscoll is Labour Mayor of the North of Tyne Combined Authority. Sir Peter Bottomley, Conservative MP for Worthing West. Why isn't it West Worthing? Uh, because it goes outside the borough of Worthing. So my my neighbour has right. East Worthing and Shoreham. Um, so that's the rule, is uh, it? it, 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 it <laughs> Uh, Boundary Commission, they're responsible. Oliver Cam is journalist and contributor to The Times, and Inaya Follerin Iman is director and founder of the Equiano Project. Right, next question is a text question from Robert in Great Dunmo. The pub at the centre of the Golly Dolls row, I'm not allowed to say the word because it's an Ofcom banned word, uh, a month ago has now shut down after suppliers decided they wouldn't provide it food and drink anymore. Is this social justice in action or just cancel culture? Now, just a bit of background to this. The White Hart Inn in Greys in Essex closed its doors on Monday night after suppliers, including Heineken and Carlsberg, told it to stop serving their lager and the campaign for real ale removed the pub from its good beer guide. Um, well, this is up your street uh, from the Equiano Project, uh, free speech and all that, freedom of expression. And I, what do you think of this? Um, so I think there's a few issues. I think the first thing is the golly dolls. And I don't think that everybody who uh, displays them or has them is motivated by racism and hatred. You know, I had, I remember growing up, I, I went to one of my neighbours' houses, was an, an elderly couple, and they did have um, those dolls there. Now, even before I was aware of all the discussions about racism, I did look at that and think it was a bit strange. It looked like a kind of caricature of, um, of a black people and I do think as time has gone on I think most people or a lot of people in society and particularly a lot of ethnic minority people just just think that it um, represents um, a, a kind of imagery that is caricaturing and I think it's totally fair and legitimate for people that um, see that at that particular pub to say that you know they're uncomfortable with that and and, and they don't want them to display that they've obviously um, not done that and I think it's for the people that go to that pub to be able to decide for themselves actually if that's the kind of place and that they want to go in. I don't necessarily think it's right for corporations to then um, essentially boycott a, an independent um, pub for um, a, a wider social backlash and I think we have seen that in lots of different areas of society where kind of corporations are taking um, particular views on contentious issues and, and contentious identity debates and I don't think that's the right approach but I do think that these golly dolls aren't really um, that appropriate and I don't think it sends the right message um, for people that want to attend the pub. Peter Bottomley. Uh, <coughs> times have changed and what was acceptable is now not. So when I was first an MP you could smoke in the underground, you could smoke on an aeroplane, you could smoke in the House of Commons, you could smoke not in the chamber, but virtually everywhere else. That's changed. And if someone now wants to light up on an aeroplane or an underground, they'd say, what's going on? And they, so, some of the expressions, you know, we, people can go back to the, the Robertson's Jam, they can go back to uh, Miss Upton, who wrote about the character we're talking about in the late 19th century. We can talk about ragdolls, all, all that. But the fact is, that's not how it's seen by some of the people. And I'm not, I haven't been to this pub, so I can't speak for them. But whether they were had, as innocent as some of the reports suggested, I don't know. So I'm not going to go further on that. But if you can seriously cause offence to people to say you shouldn't be doing this, it's fine. And for suppliers to say we don't want to be associated with that, it seems to me it's fine as well. And maybe, maybe, maybe there ought to be an, an, an off beer who starts saying you are, aren't allowed well, to hold your supplies to people you don't if like. If they're as toothless as off what or off jam, I'm not sure I see the point in that. Jamie Driscoll. Um, I haven't followed this particular story, but if um, people are doing something that, that others are finding highly offensive, then it strikes me as standard consumer choice. There isn't a law to say that people can't cause offence, is there? No, there isn't, but that's the, the whole question was, this is a consumer response. Mm. People are either not going in the pub... Or well, it's not a consumer response, is it? Choosing, it's a supplier response. Or choosing not to sell to somebody, on the basis, presumably, that they think there would then be a consumer campaign against them. So it is ultimately still a consumer response. It's about brand image. Um, and brands do spend an awful lot of time and money protecting their image, trying to appeal to certain sections of the market. Um, it doesn't surprise me, and I think that's the nature of freedom of choice. Oliver. I have followed the story, and it strikes me as a salutary example of populist politicians, specifically the Home Secretary, thinking there is an easy hit 
in standing up for a purported free speech issue. That's a complete misreading. That was a complete misreading of the case. These dolls, to use the noun that you've asked us to use, um, they were a grotesque display looking at the photographs. They were hanging from the bar. And the issue here is not... Well, specific... hanging in a sort of noose. Yes, Ooh. yes. You see, the I issue, mean, that, that is... The issue, um, yeah. that the is, issue is not isn't offensiveness. It? it is, of course, a racist image. Now, Britain, as um, Inai has intimated, is certainly a less racist society than it was 50 years ago when blacked-up actors appeared in primetime television sitcoms mm. or even 20 years ago. Um, and the, the notion that there is a free speech issue here rather than a social pathology that needs to be confronted seems to me quite preposterous. What the, what the suppliers have done is not... Um, I disagree with an eye here. Isn't, they're not taking an issue on some politically contentious matter. What they're expressing is a bureaucratic risk aversion that seems to me completely reasonable. And for a politician, for a senior politician, for a, one of the holders of the great offices of state to have intervened in this matter strikes me as the, as the principal story here and, a, and an extremely discreditable one. And what was the defence of the publican? Um... As far as I'm aware, they thought, or they maintained, that these dolls, again, I use the euphemism, I use the, uh, mm. the term you've asked us to use, were simply a, a matter of recreation, of fun. And it's not just that they're not appropriate now, they've always been, um, not just offensive, but morally iniquitous. And uh, Britain is... Uh, the, the, the type of society now where, fortunately, um, outright expressions like this bear a stigma, and so they should. Ian, can I just, just one sentence before you go on? To, a question I put to virtually every group I speak to is ask the question, when will the colour of my skin be as important but no more than the colour of my eyes or the colour of my hair? Something you notice doesn't tell you any more about me. And I think underlying this pub problem are people who won't actually face the fact that there are major problems, there is opportunity for everybody, <coughs> but you also need to be able to say, if there is racism or anti-Semitism mm. or Islamophobia, you've got to call it out. Yeah. Yeah, Inaya. yeah and I, you know, I, I, as you've outlined, you know, I, I'm a staunch supporter of freedom of expression, but I do worry about the debate about um, cancel culture and free speech um, increasingly isn't able to make those kinds of nuances and differentiations when, when there are genuinely legitimate and real conversations to be had about whether certain things are appropriate, whether society has changed and whether certain representations necessarily reflect the kind of society we, we want to live in and having a very live public debate about that, that isn't the same thing as censorship um, and so I, I don't necessarily think in this instance that this is a, a, a clear cut free speech issue I think it uh, is a representation quite a grotesque representation and caricature of some ethnic minority people that a lot of us see now and feel deeply uncomfortable with and I think the fact that the um, pub owners have been defiant and completely rejected any um, of the criticisms that have come forward to them. I, I don't think that that's um, a, a positive reflection about them. Very quickly, Oliver. Um, to take Peter's point, um, ethnicity would not be so pressing an issue if there were not the phenomena of um, racial disadvantage, that is structural no. racism, and racism in institutions, institutional racism. Where I differ from Anaya, um, I think, is I'm all in favour of a diversity of voices. I'm a near absolutist on free speech. But um, there's a problem when some of those voices, and I'm not saying that you're representative of them, uh, when some of those voices deride the concept of racial disadvantage or see the problem as behaviour within the community, the communities themselves. That sort of moralising approach to social policy isn't appropriate. Well, I, I think that there are a range of different um, viewpoints within ethnic minority communities about the reason for persistent uh, racial and ethnic disadvantage. So there are debates about individual behaviour and certain pervasive cultural attitudes and values, as well as um, deep structural inequalities within society. Um, and, and so my 
insistence is that we do have that debate and just because some people may not accept a particular narrative of institutional racism doesn't necessarily mean that they don't take the problem of racism seriously. There are different views about what constitutes racism and how best to address it. Interesting discussion. We'll take more of your calls and questions in just a moment. You're listening to Cross Question on LBC. It's 8.47. LBC. UK. Cross Question with Ian Dale on LBC. Call 0345 6060 Jamie Driscoll, Peter Bottomley, Oliver Cam and Inaya following Iman with us answering your questions. Um, here, here is a good one from Sid in Carshalton. George Osborne wants the state to get even more involved in our lives. Can the British public not be trusted to make their own decisions about their health? Now, this is after the former Chancellor has said that smoking should be completely banned, while the sugar tax, which he introduced, should be extended to fruit juices and milkshakes. Jamie. Um, I th you have to let adults be adults. Um, and I think the, the only case for banning things is where they are somehow psychoactive and likely to lead to harm to others. So that's why we, we ban um, a lot of hard drugs. And I think there's a case for, for being stricter on not serving people who are drunk in pubs. Um, but beyond that, if people want to take a risk and they are adequately informed, um, I think that's the basis of freedom, isn't it? But on smoking, obviously huge numbers of anti-smoking measures have been taken over the last 20 years, and they have worked. I mean, the, the number of teenagers smoking now is, I think, at its lowest ever point. Um, and if smoking is so dangerous to our health, which we know it is, surely he's got a point. Why not just ban it altogether? Smoking is dangerous. Um, you know, I would actively campaign against it if I had public health. Um, but... Again, I don't think banning it necessarily works. I mean, there's a lot of hard drugs in this country that are banned, but are still in wide use. Why drive something underground? Why, why give power to criminal gangs? Um, why not actually just have better public health campaigns 
Um, and as you say, it is massively reducing, particularly the smoking ban in pubs are strongly in favour of because that's something that's affecting the health of others. But if someone wants to have a cigarette in their back garden, I'm inclined to say that's their choice. But people are going to just laugh at the prospect of banning fruit juices because most yes. people think fruit juices are actually rather healthy and can count as their one in five a day, whereas actually they're incredibly unhealthy because of the sugar content in them. Um, there's an awful lot of things we do that are very, very unhealthy. You speak for yourself. <laughs> <laughs> um, Oliver. Um, Ian, I, I hate to be pedantic on this, but George Osborne is not advocating banning fruit juice. He's advocating no, he's, an extension uh, no, of he's the sugar. I didn't say banning fruit juice. No, I, no, but I Joe, think did. I... Joe did. Um, and, and that's not the case. I agree with him on both points. Um, smoking has declined precipitously in this country, particularly since the beginning of the 1970s, because of a combination of very high um, duties on it and regulation, including the ban on smoking in enclosed public spaces. And I agree with him. He's talking about not a ban on smoking, but a ban on being able to smoke for those born after a certain date on the model of... Um, a law passed in New Zealand. This is, as it happens, the editorial view of the Times as well. And I agree How with How convenient it. for you. Um, indeed. That's why, <laughs> that's, that's, why, that's why I mention it. Um, and I, I, I agree with it. Um, uh, tobacco products are a case apart, um, not just because they are highly addictive. Um, you can socially drink alcohol, and many people do, um, I certainly do with great pleasure, but very, very few people recreationally really enjoy tobacco products. And in giving up smoking, which many, many smokers wish to do, there is a problem of what economists call time inconsistency. It's much easier to pledge to give up smoking um, uh, sometime at the end of next month than it is to do it tomorrow. And if you increase the deterrent, if you increase the cost, the expense and the difficulty, it becomes a much more um, rational course to take. And I, I agree with him. And I think that's perfectly legitimate as a public health policy in a free society. In I yeah, you know, I completely disagree. I mean, I, I don't smoke and I barely drink any alcohol, but I just think, you know, in a free society, we're, we're all allowed, you know, a little bit of vices. You know, that that's our choice. That's our, our freedom. And I think... I was about to ask, what's yours? Now stop myself. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just think um, we are adults, sovereign adults, that should be able to uh, make decisions, even some of those things that might not be the best for us. And even as someone that doesn't smoke, People can't smoke indoors, they can't smoke in lots of public places. So I, I can't say that it's something that really affects um, most people that aren't smokers on a day-to-day -day basis. I think it's it's just utterly um, contemptuous, really, of the um, ability of ordinary people to make decisions over their own lives. And in, in terms of the, the issue about you know, increasing tax, sugar taxes on, on orange juice and other things, I mean, I, I just think it sends a completely the wrong message. I just think... When you look at, I mean, how would this extend with this extent to buying you know, several oranges as well? I mean, is it really enforceable? I just think, when are we going to have an attitude in society which actually respects people's decisions to make over their own lives? I'm glad to bring the two of you together on this, Jamie and Inaya. <laughs> Peter? I'm an expert on all sorts of things. First thing, adults don't take up smoking. Teenagers take up smoking. And you've got to be saying to people, how old are you? They say, I'm 15, I'm 13, I'm 18. You say, you're too young to smoke. Wrong response. You say, how old are you? They say, I'm 15, 13, 18. You say, only children take it. I'm very sorry. It's one of those things where we can be sympathetic, can't change it. And you take away the, sort of the criticism, just give a bit of understanding. Very few of them will go on smoking. It's not a grown-up thing to do. It's a childish thing to do. Second thing, George also listened to my speeches on, or my Me Lovely Me bit, how brilliant I was in reducing over-the-limit drink driving which came down by five, six, without lowering the limit, without increasing the penalties, without increasing the policing. We did it by getting people to understand you should have alcohol-free drink within reach, you should pick an alcohol-free driver, and if, like me, you drink and drive, can you decide in advance, am I drinking or am I driving? And if you give people the right language, you can change things. And there are various other subjects I can go on to, um, which I won't now, but if you want to bring me back on some stage, preferably after nine o'clock at night, I can talk about all the kinds of things where we can make our lives better, we can reduce disadvantages, handicap, penalties, pain, quite easily, give people the right language. It's the wordsmith who matters, you and Oliver and these other people. Don't do it by law, don't do it by sentencing, don't do it by taxation, don't do it by subsidy. Do it by helping <coughs> people's understanding of what their choices are. 
Right, let's have a question from Noel in Chorley Wood, who says, will you be proud to see people protesting at the coronation on Saturday? Um, Inaya. Well, you know, we've been just talking about um, freedom, and I think, you know, again, in, in a free society, it, it is OK for people to show their opposition to um, different institutions and, and, and show their disagreement. I mean, I think that will be a, a very small minority of people. I think the overwhelming majority of people that will be out on the streets on that day will be enjoying in the um, national celebrations and the historic moment um, and day that it will be. Um, I mean, obviously, some of those people may take those protests too far, and I think there'll be a, a strong police presence to make sure that that doesn't veer into anything ugly. But I do think that demonstrations of disagreements of things that are um, important to most people is, is part of living in a democracy. Okay, brief answers on this, please, Oliver. Yes, the right to free assembly is integral to a democracy, um, but they are a tiny minority, and the mainstay of the day will be the wonder that we have a constitutional democracy and a monarch with no um, uh, who is beyond politics and who. Um, uh, and who can bring the nation together at times of crisis and times of cele celebration. Jamie? Yeah, I'm, I'm proud that people have the freedom to protest, and I'm always in favour of a, a plurality of voices. Um, there's a debate to be had about the, the relevance of the monarchy, but um, what I really like is that a load of people will be having enjoying having a day off. Yeah, two days afterwards, which I don't really see the point of personally, but uh, um, well, I, I, should be, I should be availing myself of the opportunity, it has to be said. I that, think uh, hopefully the weather will be good, and uh, I'm all for, um, you know, a big national celebration like when we won the Women's Euros, these sorts of things. I think they're actually quite good. Peter? Well, t two simple answers and quite brief. First is, I wouldn't like it if a rugby player parachuted down in the middle of a soccer game. That would be disruptive. I don't want disruption, thank you very much. And the second thing is, I was explaining to an American audience last year, when the Queen introduced a new Prime Minister, the Queen died, the Prime Minister didn't last very long, and people came out into the streets with flowers. That's the sort of country I like being part of. I have to say, the weather forecast for the weekend in London is really bad. It's not as bad as it was it's on rain, the night before the coronation. Rain, three when I was sleeping out in the mall. More. Did you? I did. Really? And I happen to know who was with Queen Salute of Tonga. It wasn't Haile Selassie, it was the su Abraham, the Sultan of Kelantan. That's the sort of thing you learn on this programme. You wouldn't get that on any, any other radio station, would you? I must admit, last night, uh, when I left the studio, I had to walk to Charing Cross Station because they were starting the um, rehearsals for the coronation. Your mutual friend of mine, Mark, he, he went and w actually watched the Royal Coach going down the mall, uh, which I, I wish I'd sort of known all that would, would really happen. I didn't realise I'd actually used the real one. Um, anyway, let's take our final text question from Jenny in Wandsworth. This is going to test you. Gladiators is coming back to our TV screens after more than 20 years with Bradley Welsh. I mean, who else could possibly host a programme nowadays? Uh, hosting alongside his son. If you could revive one classic old TV show, which is it and who would be hosting it? Oliver. <laughs> I don't want to sound po-faced, but I've never seen Gladiators, and I'm not quite no, sure what it is. Just don't bother. Um, don't bother. But when I was um, when I was an impressionable teenager, there was an extraordinary series of television programmes hosted by Brian McGee, who was a Labour MP, who was a philosopher, he was an academic philosopher, and he hosted. <laughs> long discussion programmes, uh, they were BBC, uninterrupted by advertising, with some of the greatest, I mean, literally, the greatest thinkers of the 20th century. Um, people like A.J. Ayer, Noam Chomsky, um, oh. a great thing. As well, on linguistics, he is important. Yeah, I know, politics, I know. I, 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 I had to um, learn him uh, for my linguistics degree, and I hated it. Um, so that sort of series of programmes, I don't think there's anyone else who could do it. McGee was a brilliant, who died very recently at a very advanced stage, was a brilliant popularizer of, of ideas. Um, but that sort of highbrow programming, I think, could, could do with a, with a renaissance. Inaya. I'd say Blind Date. I don't know if anyone oh remembered it. I'm, I'm a sucker for romance. So Paddy McGuinness, who should revive oh, the show. Paddy. Take Me Out, First no. Dates, Undateable. Can and people not think of anyone original to <laughs> these things? I mean, Paddy McGuinness, he's another he's one that's brilliant. on like, everything. <laughs> You're, 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 you're swooning, let me tell you. <laughs> um, Jamie. Oh, um, well, it's, it's not a quiz show, but actually I recently um, 
me and the kids, we watched When the Boat Comes In, which is a piece of social history of the North East, is brilliant, wonderfully acted, um, a great period drama. So I think that sort of programme I'd like to see more of. Um, who would host it? Oh, I have no idea. Um, That's not really uh, a programme to host, is it? It's not, no. no. OK, Peter. I would have, not television, because I'm older than that, I'd have radio, I'd have Elsie and Doris Waters doing Gert and Daisy, and I'd, if you had to have someone living, I'd get Penelope Keith to do the introduction to it. I've, I have to say, I've never heard of it. They were the sisters of Jack Warner. They were oh, Dick Sinner and Dot Green, and, yes. He, he did television, but the, well, th they, they were just two very, very funny performers. I think I would nominate Moonlighting with Jackie Smith and myself in the leading roles, sort of will they, won't they? <laughs> no, they won't. Anyway, thank you very much indeed to Sir Peter Botany, Jamie Driscoll, Inaya Fuller in Iman, and Oliver Cam. Uh, coming up in a moment, we are going to turn our attention to Deaf Awareness Week because it's a subject that doesn't get a lot of airplay on the radio, deafness, and the challenges that deaf people have to face in their ordinary lives. And you might think, well, it's a bit of an odd thing to do on the radio because deaf people won't be able to hear you. Well, actually, that isn't true. Um, so I'm, I'm quite looking forward to this. We've got a really wonderful guest coming in, Rose Ailing uh, Ellis, and it, so, sorry, Samantha Baines, and it's going to be a, a great discussion, an opportunity for you to tell us about the challenges that deaf people face in everyday society. And we want to take your calls as well, 0345 6060 973. On your radio, on Global Player and 